right, looks like the live stream show software is working. Another crazy day in markets, I'm using air quotes, because we have the dollar index down. We have a press release from Pfizer that was apparently delayed for weeks. They already knew this and were sitting on it before the election, probably because they don't like President Trump, even though he agreed to give them, I think, $2 billion to accelerate the vaccine on Project Warp Speed. But he was also talking about restricting other drug profits, and that's a no-no for Big Pharma. So the stock market jumps and the gold price, the paper gold price, because no physical gold was actually uh, sold, as my friend gold, F gold Fund Manager Dave Kranzler noted on Twitter hours ago, some of my other friends were saying the same thing, the paper gold price went in a very short amount of time. I'm looking here in the Kitco ch charts, 24-hour spot gold went from $1,960 down to $1, below $1,860, a 100-point drop. The most drop in seven years on paper price in a very short amount of time. Back For those of us that have been in the gold and silver paper markets for a long time now, decade or more, we are very used to old paper price smashes. However, the gold price is starting to rally a little bit. The gold price is already back up about 18 bucks, almost 19 bucks. Looks like um, now that the overnight market is starting to trade. Almost back to 1890 on the paper gold price. So, this live stream show was from stories from last week about the Bank of England ramping up stimulus again to tackle the global pandemic and Brexit hit. And also, after I did the Australian Central Bank show, the Reserve Bank of Australia show, I found another interesting article with, chat, with that chart you can see there on your screen to the right of central bank balance sheets starting to go vertical now. And what are these central banks doing? They are creating currency units out of thin air to buy government bonds and buy other bonds. However, the deflationists say that this is not debt monetization, that this is not inflationary, because my thesis is this is stagflate tax a lie. Also, the deflationists, after having long conversations with them, I actually got one deflationist to admit about asset price inflation, but then he said that that doesn't count as inflation, which is, I don't know how he said that. He said asset prices are rising, but that's not inflation. I don't know exactly what that means. Um, the school I'm from, where currency units are created out of thin air to buy things like bonds and stocks and toxic sausage, that's monetary inflation creating asset price inflation. But okay, if you want to rationalize whatever analysis you have, then fine. Good luck to you, sir. Um, you, but your bond trades are being supported by central banks nonetheless. So the... <laughs> So the Bank of England, this article came out Thursday, November 5th. The Bank of England increased its already huge bond buying stimulus by larger than expected 150 billion pounds or $195 billion as it braced for more economic damage from new uh, global pandemic lockdowns and damage from Brexit too. However, the amount of increase in the bond buying program where they created British pounds or currency units out of thin air to monetize debt, to buy bonds, it was not enough. So their currency actually on the day this article came out, uh, Thursday, November 5th, the British pound on the exchange rate actually increased. <laughs> well, my educated guess on why that actually happened is because you have all these other governments in the currency war in a global race to debase with all these central bankers gone wild, race to the bottom. They are all trying to do it and the market is trying to figure out which central banker, which government is devaluing their currency the fastest. Which one is creating more currency and it's out of thin air for social program spending or to buy bonds, buy government bonds? Because that seems to be the main common theme. The size of government is not contracting during this pandemic. It's mostly the private sector. Actually, the size of government here in the U.S., according to GDP numbers, is now about the size of Sweden. So the uh, debt to GDP, oh, excuse me, the um, government size to GDP, not debt to GDP, debt, debt to GDP is really bad too, but the size of government to GDP is now about 40, 45%, depending upon how you measure it here in the US. It has increased massively since before the pandemic. And that's before all these new transfer payment programs, social programs, if Biden is in the White House, although with the Republicans, with Trump, we may still get MMTQE anyway. 
may still get more MMT QE checks anyway. So on the day England began a four-week lockdown to curb a second wave of the pandemic, which is killing as many Britons each day as it may, the Bank of England said it was still looking into the pros and cons of taking interest rates negative, but gave no update on the process. Oh, negative interest rates is so horrible. And they're go talking about cashless society and government cryptocurrencies. And yes, Mr. Troll, I'm well aware of the difference between government cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. And now you have with Bitcoin, you have Stanley Druckenmiller saying he owns Bitcoin. You have all these Wall Street hedge fund guys that are pumping Bitcoin and long Bitcoin. And Silicon Valley is long Bitcoin. So Bitcoin seems to be the one of the preferred trades compared to gold right now. But the difference between government cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is Bitcoin, not counting the forks, Bitcoin has a fixed supply. Government cryptocurrencies, I don't trust the government. I don't trust government economic data. Some governments lie more than, more than others. So I do not trust the supply amount for government cryptocurrencies. And people are like, oh, they'll be transparent. Oh, they'll be transparent. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. If you've ever played video games, there are something called cheat codes, and the government is going to have lots and lots of cheat codes. Look, if they can do the levels of Banana Republic, third world country, third excuse me, third world country election fraud that has happened that happened before election day and on election day and after election day here in the United States in multiple states, and hardly anyone or no one is going to get charged with felonies. No one's going to prison for ballot fraud and election fraud for count, even admitting it on video. It's recorded on video and audio. I've heard some of it. There's, and people are bragging about committing, throwing tens of thousands of ballots away in the trash. The government can get away with a lot. Let's just put it that way, especially with no rule of law and corrupt court systems and judges and political bias. Okay, pros and cons taking interest rates negative, but gave no update on the process. Quote, if the outlook for inflation weakens, the committee stands ready to take whatever action, necess action uh, additional action, excuse me, is necessary to achieve its remit. So they're going for inflation targeting. They're going for inflation targeting. It's inflate or die, as they say, or stagflate tax and lie, or whatever social program spending or debt monetization. They'll create British pounds out of thin air to buy government bonds or other assets or help British banks or just to weaken the currency because that's the game plan for all these governments. The Bank of England said as it cut its growth forecast, Britain's economy was set to shrink by record 11% in 2020 overall, more than the 9.5% it had forecast in March, and it cut its estimate for the next year's recovery. Quote, the outlook for the economy remains unusually uncertain. <laughs> the Bank of England said, well, yeah, because they went on another lockdown. Bank of England said, instead of relying on adults to make business owners and adults to make smart decisions on their own. Nanny state, lots of video cameras everywhere in London. They locked it down. I, th I think in the United Kingdom, if you don't live with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, if you live at a separate address, I don't even think you're allowed to go over there and have sex now. That's how bad it is. My God. Probably shouldn't have said that. This will probably get demonetized because those dating channels all get demonetized. But that's just another example of how crazy things are in the United Kingdom with their big government, their bureaucracy, their crazy rules and regulations, their nanny state. Quote, the outlook... Uh, unbelievable. Quote, the outlook for the economy remains, uh, and I think that was before the lockdown, this this other lockdown. The outlook for the economy remains unusually, and so you can go, if you want to go to your girlfriend or boyfriend's apartment or flat or house in London area, you're risking prison time or a 10,000 pound fine, something, it's, it's insane. The outlook for the economy remains unusually uncertain, the Bank of England said, pointing to the global pandemic and the still unresolved trading relationship between Britain and its closest trading partners in the European Union after January 1st. Britain's economy has been supported by a surge in debt-fueled spending by the government, and the Bank of England is buying up many of those bonds. The old-school classical economist would say this is debt monetization. Explain right there. This is currency created out of thin air, monetary inflation, to buy up bonds, to prop up bond prices, so the size of government doesn't have to contract. And this is hidden with hiding a real inflation rate. We know in England, England's own Office of National Statistics in the United Kingdom, they are probably the only government agency that for the last four or five years at least has been releasing an annual shrinkflation report. And so the official inflation rate in England 
is I think 1% or it might even be lower than that. So the Bank of England, the official inflation rate in the uh, economy in England is very, very low, the official government inflation rate. Meanwhile, in reality, the shrinkflation amount if you go and read the Office of National Statistics reports and the shrinkflation rate is like the price stay, might stay the same on food items, but the portion size or substitution is drastically decreasing. So I think it's like 6% to 13% per year on a lot of food items. It's an insane amount of shrinkflation on a lot of food items in England. But so you have the official government consumer price index inflation rate that the Bank of England is using, saying there is no inflation, we need to increase our inflation target, versus the reality of the Office of National Statistics actually, and they're the only ones, as far as I know, the only government that's actually doing a shrinkflation report, talking about how badly the consumer is getting killed with lower portion size, lower quality of food with substitution, and that's the reality of the situation. So it's uh, for certain food items because infl it, real inflation in the Austrian School of Economics with the Cantillon effect, when there's currency and credit sloshing around and asset price inflation and tons of distortions and all these other governments are all trying to devalue their currency too and all this devalued currency is, le and is leaking into global supply chains, the inflation, the amount of inflation in supply chains that's affecting the cost of food and other goods that are imported is not going to be even. It's not going to be evenly distributed. This is a common mistake that a lot of people um, expect. They expect the inflation rate to say the inflation. You say the inflation rate's five or six percent, but this these prices didn't go up five or six percent. But that's not how, according to the Austrian School of Economics and the Cantillon effect, that all this currency and credit sloshing around does. It makes certain prices don't go up at all. Other prices, like asset prices, might go up a lot. And other prices, like consumer discretionary items, which people don't have the savings for, don't have the, jo the jobs or the income for, those prices may collapse. It creates unintended consequences and distortions. That's the Cantillon effect. Okay, Britain's economy supported surge in debt fueled spending by the government, and the Bank of England is buying up many of those bonds. They're going to reduce the value like all governments. The U.S. government's going to do the same thing, Japanification. They're going to reduce the value of that debt in real terms. So nominal terms, they're going to prop those bond prices up. The U.S. is doing it. All these governments are trying to do what Japan is doing. Prop up the value of the bonds in nominal terms and in real terms inflate the value, the debt burden with the currency. Normally, the currency is the release valve. That's what you'll hear a lot of other experts say. The currency is the release valve. So like hedge fund manager Jesse Felder and others you're going to, but the problem, the reason you're not going to see this on exchange rate probably is you're, the market's trying to figure out, wait a second, all these governments are all trying to, in a currency war, they're all trying to do the same thing. They're all trying to devalue. So that's why you're not seeing all these currencies just collapse because they're all, it's relative valuation on currency exchange rate. That's why you're only seeing some currencies go down a certain amount against the dollar. But the easiest way to devalue, and I've talked about this now for weeks, the easiest way for another country to devalue their own currency is to buy dollars. And that's why the dollar relative to a lot of other currencies, yes, the dollar index is down a little bit. It's down 92.65, still in the, the dollar tug of war, still in a trading range. But that's why the dollar index and the dollar exchange rate against a lot of other currencies is not down more. Because the easiest way for another foreign central bank to devalue their own currency to make their currency weaker is to buy dollars, by far. Finance Minister Rishi Sunak is due to speak in Parliament later on Thursday as emergency spending and tax cuts. So they tried to do supply side economics with tax cuts, saddled Britain with its big, big, it creates budget deficits. You don't do sub, supply side economics is dangerous. Biggest budget deficit since World War II. The Bank of England kept its, especially when the real economy is not booming. The Bank of England kept its benchmark bench rate at 0.1% as expected in the Reuters poll. It made little mention of negative rates while a con cons consultation excuse me, with banks over the practicalities is underway. Sterling rose against the dollar. See, that's surprising, despite this announcement of a bond buying program. Rose against the dollar and the euro 
after the announcements and bond yields fell. See, that's very unusual. The increase in the size of the Bank of England's asset purchase program took it to 895 billion pounds, 50 billion pounds more than expected by most economists. But apparently these other governments and central banks are devaluing their currencies and monetizing their debt and racing to the bottom in this global currency war race to debase with central bankers gone wild even faster. The central bank said that would give it enough firepower to stretch its buying of government bonds through the end of 2021, but the purchases could be sped up if needed. Of course, because we're in a fiat currency and credit Ponzi scheme where there's over $254 trillion and growing quickly of total debt outstanding. It's probably like $270 trillion total at this point. Not all of that debt out of the $250 a uh, trillion plus is dollar denominated debt, but a large chunk. You also have uh, Chinese yuan denominated debt, euro, no, de, euro denominated debt, and others. But those make up, the major currencies make up the largest amount of debt. But look, none of, mathematically, none of that debt's, uh, excuse me, mathematically, it's not possible to pay back all that debt. There's just not enough cash flow. And even before the pandemic, servicing that much debt was dicey. And now we have a lot less cash flow in the economy. Because the real economy, there's not as many jobs, the businesses are not doing well, you're still seeing unemployment, and you have all these governments, especially the U.S. government, talking about replacing income, talking about MMT and universal basic income, and handing people checks to not work, to just consume. So that's why I say the global economy, the current global financial system of debt-based fiat currency and credit is a Ponzi scheme. The amount of currency and credit must grow. And when it doesn't grow, normally it turns into like a 2008 financial crisis when there was a tiny drop in credit for a short, there was a tiny drop in credit. Chris Martinson had a good chart on this, Dr. Chris Martinson. I think the chart it showed maybe like a six month drop in credit and that helped cause the 2008, one of the reasons why the 2008 financial crisis and then the credit engines restarted and you started to see, this is why the Fed stepped in with all this press release manipulation. And by the way, I was listening to an interview with Danielle DiMartino Booth on her YouTube channel from a couple weeks ago where she interviewed Peter Caccini, a money manager from Wall Street. And he was talking about the off-balance sheet special purpose vehicles. And those things off-balance sheet, they need to be audited. They can be leveraged up tenfold, 10, 10x on uh, fractional reserves. So who knows how many corporate bonds and junk bonds and other toxic sausage and all the different types of special purpose vehicles the Fed is allowed to stuff into there. But all this um, Wall Street, this is why you had lost my train of thought there for a second this is why you have the federal reserve just step in with press release manipulation rules changes moving the goalposts, manipulations bailouts late february march april they tried all these different things but they the end result is that they sold around two trillion more in corporate bonds junk bonds and the wall street toxic derivative sausage making machine which is something the Wall Street banks make enormous amounts of money on, selling this toxic sausage, selling mortgage-backed securities, commercial mortgage-backed securities, um, selling leveraged loans, selling collateralized loan obligations, also trading, leveraging up, borrowing in the euro dollar market or the repo market and going and gambling in the casino on leveraged currency trades, leveraged bond trades and derivatives. If that stops, the system stops. So the system must continue to churn out new credit. The Ponzi scheme must continue, must not be allowed to stop issuing new credit. And then everyone pretends that, oh, the prices on these uh, derivatives, the prices on these assets, the prices on these bonds is high. No one talks about the cash flow. Can, we, can these bonds be paid back? Is there cash flow to service the debt? Oh, but we just sold two trillion more bonds. Who cares? Look at all the hedge fund managers and Wall Street investment bankers and all these guys that just made seven, eight figures in a couple months. They just made seven, eight figure bonuses. Oh, they got to buy a fifth mansion. They got to buy three new sugar babies a month. But no one talks about, is there cash flow to service all these bonds that were sold by the corporations and, the, and uh, whoever else? <laughs> so, but Wall Street already collected their fees. It's someone else's problem. That's how Wall Street views it.
Okay, the, the rest uh, talks about the in official inflation rate in England. Also, I have this, the rest of the Bank of England article. I also have this November 4th article that came out after my Bank of Australia, Reserve Bank of Australia show last week. I found this article, the scale of Australia's bond buying spree is closing in on the feds. The Reserve Bank of Australia's new quantitative easing program is set to close in on the Federal Reserve's when measured against the size of the economy, highlighting the scale of its latest stimulus effort. The plan to buy Australian $100 billion, or $79.1 billion US, in bonds over six months kicks off with the Reserve Bank, and of course this is to create new currency units out of thin air, to buy those bonds, kicks to help devalue the currency, to help boost exports, kicks off with the Reserve Bank of Australia announcing it will purchase $2 billion in federal government securities at Thursday's auction. Governor Philip Lowe said Thursday, excuse me, said Tuesday, he estimates the RBA's balance sheet will have almost tripled once purchases are completed by mid-2021. So let's see here. The Reserve Bank of Australia is the yellow one. So it's just starting to move. It's at the bottom of the screen there on the Bloomberg chart. It's the bottom yellow one. It's just starting to inch up. The angle of the Reserve Bank of Australia's balance sheet is just starting to go vertical. Completed by mid-2021, compared with the position at the start of the year, Bill Evans, chief economist at Westpac Banks, reckons the RBA's assets will swell to around $550 billion Australian dollars, or 275 of gross domestic product. The Fed's balance sheet is sitting around 34% of GDP, and most economists don't expect it to ramp up the pace, ramp up the pace of its asset purchases anytime soon. Hmm, I don't know about that. Most economists don't expect the Fed's balance sheet to ramp up the pace of its assets purchases anytime too soon. Maybe that's because the Fed is getting away with buying all these ass assets, and I'm using air quotes here, off balance sheet in those Enron special purpose vehicles that they're now allowed to do since March, that they're allowed to have 10x leverage on with fractional reserve banking, according to Peter Caccini, who was interviewed by Daniel DiMartino Booth a couple weeks ago. And, of course, they're not going to get audited on it. Quote, the RBA will be very cl rapidly closing in from a, uh, on the Fed from a uh, standing start. Evans wrote in a note, he added that the RBA has also certainly left open the option of further QE. The intent international backdrop is central to the RBA's decision to add longer dated bonds purchased to its existing three-year yield curve control plan. Because all these central banks have to do debt monetization, yield curve control, Japanification, and stagflate tax lie. It is crazy that all of them are trying to do it. Oh, and no one's talking about the currency war or the race to debase. The rest of the article will be below the video in the information and description section. I'll take a look at, at Super Chats now. Thank you for the $4.99 Super Chat J6. It is much appreciated. A walk with Josh. Thank you for the... SGD, I'm not sure which currency that is, but thank you for the $10 of SGD currency. Walk with Josh. Okay, how do you see the miners be like till end of the year? Do you see another March event or is it time to buy now? Hmm. Well, uh, they've been manipulating the stock market so much, it's tough to see too many stock market crashes because I've heard the stock market's going to crash again. If Biden won, Trump was warning. If Biden won, the stock market was going to crash. Who knows at this point, there's so many manipulations at 3 a.m. on S&P E-mini uh, e um, e 500 futures contracts. So the miners have already gotten hammered with the gold price. So this is why, Josh, you don't buy all of your position at once. So I would say there's still a probability we could have a March event, but I don't think it's, it's like 70, 80, 90%. Is it 40 or 50 percent? Maybe. Is it 30 percent probability that we have another March event in the miners? Probably. So I don't think it's 70, 80, 90 percent. Um, I will say, and I was going to write an article on this for patrons, I think that the gold mining CEOs all were hoping for a correction in gold price. Um, from speaking with a lot of gold, um, from listening to conference calls and reading conference call transcripts of gold mining CEOs, it sounds like they wanted to do start doing some mergers and acquisitions with where you're going to have larger gold miners maybe start to buy a junior with one good gold mine or a mid-tier 
gold uh, or a mid-tier gold miner producer. There was a really good interview with John Hathaway. He worked at Tocqueville Gold Fund. He's now the Sprott Gold Fund manager for managed for their managed gold stocks, and he said that gold miners are selling at a they, this was before the cr the crash in paper gold prices recently. This interview was done a, a month ago, I think. He said that the producing gold miners, their shares were selling at a 30 to 40% discount compared to building a new mine. So it's actually more expensive now to build a new mine than to go and buy a producing mine or a producing gold miner with multiple mines so i think um the market's gonna do um the gold mining companies are gonna especially ones that have a lot of cash don't have too much debt so maybe like a newmont mining or an Ag agnico eagle now that their capex is paid off they've increased their dividends their balance sheets are good you may start to see mergers you may start to see some good mergers now depending upon how long this gold correction lasts so I think, um, and the royalty and streaming companies, the larger ones, they were looking actually, the larger ones like Franco Nevada, Royal Gold, Weed and Precious Metals, they were actually looking for correction in gold and silver prices to do larger deals. So you may start to see those deals done now. It depends how long the correction lasts though. But bottom line, the Fed's balance sheet, unless the Fed is able to keep everything off balance sheet in the special purpose vehicle, look, if the... If the Fed is able to, to create literally unlimited special purpose vehicles, then the Fed's balance sheet won't rise. Someone's buying, someone's going to buy those junk bonds. Someone's going to buy those uh, commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities, those leveraged loans, those collateralized loan obligations, um, those investment-grade corporate bonds that get downgraded, that the uh, bond funds and the pension funds have to dump because they're no longer rated as investment-grade. Someone's going to have to buy those. And who do you think is going to have to buy those? I'm guessing it's going to be the Fed. Now, is the Fed going to be honest with us and tell us the truth about it? Are they going to issue a press release? Maybe. But the Fed has been granted since March the ability to create Enron-style special purpose vehicles. And they are not subject to full audits. This is why we need more audits. Look, I would love central banks to end to end the Fed. It's not realistic. Although if Janet Yellen is appointed Treasury Secretary, Biden's in the White House and Janet Yellen's Treasury Secretary, it looks like that's something uh, more of a transition to merge the Fed and the Treasury, similar to the Bank of England 1946. Super chat from Martin. Thank you for the four dollars and ninety-nine cents. Super chat's much appreciated. So I would put the probability of another March event, I would put it at most 40 or 50 percent. Um, we're already having a gold correction. So when the dollar index is weak and gold should be strong, the paper price is smashed. This to me tells me that the Fed's balance sheet, look, the Fed's going to have to buy a lot of stuff. I'll do an article on this for patrons over the next uh, hopefully couple weeks. The Fed's, I'll lay out the case why the Fed's balance sheet's going to have to double in the next two or three years. And yet it's going to be ugly. But if the Fed can put everything off balance sheet, then who knows? If they can just create unlimited special purpose vehicles, and I'm guessing here because the Fed's allowed to create some special purpose vehicles, but if the Fed's allowed to create some special purpose, purpose vehicles, maybe they can get away with creating almost unlimited special purpose vehicles. Because the, the laws just keep changing. The Fed's not supposed to be able to buy all this toxic sausage, all these derivatives mortgage-backed securities. The rules were changed so they could buy mortgage-backed securities. The rules were changed so the Fed could create special purpose vehicles. See, this is what I mean by rules changes. When the government or central bank gets in trouble, they just change the rules. When the, ele when the election results looked bad, look at what the states were doing with the ballots. That was a bunch of rules changes. Yeah, fiat currency sucks. I agree with you, Sean. He had uh, better cuss words than that, but I don't want to get demonetized. I don't want to give YouTube another excuse to take away the $3 to $5 in Google AdWords revenues I'm still getting on this. So thank you very much for the super chats. 
or you can sign up for my Patreon at only five bucks a month. There is almost 150 articles, audio podcasts, and technical analysis chart work behind the paywall. That is unique there for only five bucks a month. I don't think you can top that anywhere else. Okay, we have one more super chat here from Top Earth. New Zealand, $10. Thank you for the $10 super chat. He asks, where would you run to, Jason, when the shit hits HSHTF, shit hits the fan? Okay, so the rich billionaires were going to New Zealand, but New Zealand's on lockdown, isn't it? So, or at least parts of it are. And I've heard all these crazy stories about how babies can't be transported from one hospital to another in another province or state. I think in Australia and maybe also in New Zealand, it's just a mess. Uh, I think in New Zealand for months now, a boyfriend or girlfriend who didn't live in the same address couldn't go see each other. Or maybe they, they changed that restriction. It's just, it's so ridiculous. I don't know if there's anywhere safe. See, yeah, this is why diversification is important. There is no perfect place. Because you have all these greedy governments that don't want to cut the size of government. Okay, I've gotten lectured by government employees that, oh, you don't know, these, these business CEOs are the worst. These corporate executives are so bad. But I've lived here in the Washington, D.C. metro area for 20 years. And a lot of these politicians and bureaucrats, honestly, they are more greedy and more selfish than some of the worst fraudsters I've ever met in the Canadian Vancouver junior mining sector. So there are government employees and there are bureaucrats and politicians that are way more greedy. And they'll change the rules. They'll screw you over. So I don't think there's a, a perfect place to live. Hong Kong was great years ago. It was the freest place on earth many years ago. It was voted 20, 25 years in a row. It was voted the freest place on earth. And you can't say that anymore. So things change very, very quickly now. That's It's just a sad truth. And there's, I, I've had friends who've moved down to South America and they've got, or, or to the Caribbean in islands, uh, certain islands down there, Bahamas, they've gotten stuff stolen at their places. There is no perfect place. It depends, it depends on how much money you have, what type of weather you like, if you can diversify your assets. We're in a very dangerous time in history, similar to the 1920s and 1930s. Lots of people are very, very in favor of socialism, more socialism. There's a lot of younger adults that, are, that have no negative connotations whatsoever with socialism, none. And look, I just said, I just said earlier in the show that now the U the size of government here in the US is like 40, 45% of GDP. And we're still going to have young adults here in the US and lazy Americans that won't do any research. And they're going to blame all this mess. You know, the corruption in the political system, corporate CEOs in bed with government, you know, all this stuff with lobbying, all this, all this rules changes, all this mess. Problems with central banks. And it'll just, they won't do any research, won't, and they'll just blame it on capitalism. And those people get to vote, and they voted. They just voted. Or they helped rig the elections. They were working, some of them were Marxists and were working, um, one of them admitted on Facebook that he threw away, one of them is a self-proclaimed Marxist, and he proudly posted on Facebook that he threw away tens of thousands of, Donald, of votes for Donald Trump, him and his coworkers, and he was told to do this, but he said he would have done it anyway. He threw away tens of thousands of votes in the trash in Michigan that were votes for Donald Trump. Now, I don't think that's capitalism's fault that a self-proclaimed Marxist decided he wanted to commit felonies and throw away tens of thousands of votes in the trash for Donald Trump. Is he going to go to prison? Are we going to enforce the rule of law? Is the U.S. the world's largest, richest, and most powerful banana republic in world history? I wish I, I, wish I had better news. The Federal Reserve, the U.S. government, the crooks in Congress all seem to want to manipulate the stock market higher. Keep the bond market propped. I think the main rules for manipulation are ha smash the paper gold price at weird hours when you can to stop gold from going up too quickly. 
uh, manipulate the stock market higher, keep the bond prices propped up, and then bail out the banks and big banks, large banks, and large hedge funds to prevent the derivative from failing. And we have no idea about the amount of bailouts that uh, the large banks and the large hedge funds got. There's an excellent interview with Christopher Cole from Grant Williams' podcast from about a few days ago. Must listen. Talks about all the bailouts that the large banks and the large hedge funds got in February and March. So the, most of the bailout money and the PPP loan program was a mess, like Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud, Social Security fraud type of mess with fraud. But um, the majority of the bailout money went to large banks and large hedge funds. Because that's who that that's who really matters. I mean, I guess they'll they'll occasionally send you a check to buy to buy you a vote, especially if it's like a twelve hundred dollar check and they think you're gonna go gamble in the stock market. That'll keep most of the sheeple happy for a little while. Okay. We have uh, one more super chat here from Animalia. Nicole Chrysalis Nix, thank you for the five dollar super chat, four dollars and ninety-nine cents. She is also a Patreon account contributor, so thank you there too. One of over a thousand a month. Any reason why Rick Rule, Peter Schiff don't discuss the derivatives market, LIBOR, or SOFR? I have no idea. Uh, Rick Rule focuses on mining stocks and credit analysts. So he's not, he doesn't focus as much on the total global macro. He focuses on like geopolitical risk for mining companies and evaluating deposits. So funding mining companies. That's where most of his focus is, and on credit, maybe credit markets, and uh, supply demand for commodities. Peter Schiff, I don't, I, I think Peter Schiff focuses mostly on the U.S. government. He focuses mostly on the U.S. government's finances. Because uh, in the past, I haven't seen a lot of his analysis lately. In the past, he was saying that every other government had better finances than the U.S. government, but the truth is they're all doing it, and this is why the and. This is why the dollar is propped up, because as I have explained for weeks now, the, the easiest way for another foreign central bank to devalue their own currency is to create their own currency out of thin air and then buy U.S. dollars. And that helps the way the global financial system is designed, and that is the easiest way to devalue their own currency, is to, buy, is to create currency units out of thin air and buy U.S. dollars. So that... That is artificial demand for dollars that props up the dollar temporarily. How much longer can this last? It is tough to say because we have all these governments doing really, really insane things. Uh, Top Bird says he wonders if Montenegro is any good. Well, the problem with a lot of these governments is they here in the U.S., they charge an exit tax if you want to uh, forfeit your citizenship. But if you live outside the country, if you keep your U.S. citizenship and you live in another country, I think the first 90000 is tax-free. So if you maintain your U.S. citizenship and you live in another country, I think like the first 90000 of income I think is tax-free. But um, if we're going to go, if things are going more and more socialism – and I haven't talked about this in a while, but then we're starting to look at um, not only cashless society and um, global government cryptocurrencies, but also the suggestion that um, Marxist Thomas Piketty wrote. He wrote a book, I think, 2012. I haven't talked about this in a long time. But since we're heading like further and further down big government, bigger and bigger government, and the size of government is, is either staying the same or growing – um, rel uh, size of GDP and there's more social transfer payments, we might get to the point where all of these governments, and this is what really, really worries me, because if this happens, then nowhere's safe. Then um, all these, or a lot of these governments join together and then there's a global wealth tax. So if you try to give up your citizenship and you try to you know, go to another country where there's less taxes, more freedom, the other governments may force a smaller government into the system. So Piketty wrote that um, under the current system in his book that uh, rich people can just pick up and move, sell their businesses. If a country like France tries to go to like 70% income tax, you had a lot of people in France just leave the country. They didn't want to pay it. 
But um, Piquette wrote that the best way to enforce that, to stop that, where rich people either sell their businesses, evade taxes, is to for all these governments to work together and have a global wealth tax. So then you cannot leave from one country to another for more freedom and to pay less taxes. So I hope we are not headed there. But at this point, um, I would not be surprised. Because uh, we're headed down a very dangerous path. Okay, we are at 40 minutes now. That is well past the time. I'm starting to get like my memory starting to go. I'm starting to get a little bit of a migraine. Hopefully it does not last five or six hours. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much to my patrons who are sticking with me. I know there's like a depression and the real economy is bad and the government's lying about the unemployment rate. The real un the real unemployment rate here in the U.S. is not like 6.9% or something. That is, I, don't, I definitely do not believe that based on my conversations anecdotally. Supposedly in the best uh real economy area here in the u.s that's insulated in the dc metro area bye for now i have a lot of other good content the rest of the week